Dr. Caroline Norma researches the commercial sexual exploitation of women and children in Asia and Northeast Asia. She's a lecturer at the School of Global, Urban and Social Studies at RMIT and she is the author of The Japanese Comfort Women and Sexual Slavery During the China and Pacific Wars and that's coming out in 2016. <laughs> uh, Dr. Caroline is a leading feminist advocate in Australia against prostitution and speaks in Asia on pornography and its harms for women and children. Caroline. Thanks so much, Caitlin, and, uh, just get back that. and thanks to Collective Shout and everyone here for having me. I really appreciate it. I'll just turn the line off. Yeah, that's all. Okay, I think we're okay. Yeah, but thanks to everyone for coming along. Um, um, it's a real privilege to be here and also to be here with the other speakers that we've had so far. Um, like the other, the previous speaker, I'll jump right in as well so that we can get through the content and I'll try and take that content slowly. Um, I tend to be a, a policy legislation and case law analyst, so a lot of my, unfortunately my empirical research isn't um, quite as stunning as, as some of the other speakers we've had today, but it tends to try to establish a policy framework for addressing uh, the harms of pornography for children and young people and, and adults as well. But I'll focus on children and young people today. So as you know, some, <clears throat> some of the harms of pornography for children and young people are reflected in Australian legislation. One form of harm that is recognised in a cluster of provisions relates to pornography production, and that includes uh, distribution and selling. I think we know production quite well, and uh, particularly that production using children or representing children. So that kind of legislation that we already have to some degree. Consumer demand for this production activity uh, that is enacted to the consumption of child pornography is also addressed in another cluster of legal provisions. So production related activity in relation to children and their use in pornography as well as consumption related activity in relation to children in pornography are uh, reflected as harms in Australian legislation to some degree. And thirdly, procurement of children for the production of pornography is covered by provisions that legislate against grooming. So that word grooming tends to, whenever you see that in legislation and policy, tends to pop up in relation to procurement activity for the use of children in pornography. So um, just for the people coming in now, I'm kind of going through preliminary materials, so it's actually working quite well. This, this is all just preliminary to the to the, my main point. So this uh, final category of legislation addresses child procurement activity conducted specifically on the internet. So you'll see as soon as you get to procurement related provisions, you'll see the word grooming and then you'll see the word internet or technology related uh, just, uh, language. So even with all these different pieces of legislation addressing various harms of pornography for children and young people, there are still forms of harm not yet reflected in Australian legis legislation or reflected in very narrow ways, is my uh, argument today. For example, while child procurement, the last category I mentioned, uh, is addressed in Australian legislation as a specific harm linked to pornography, procurement is imagined to be a crime uh, facilitated through the internet, conducted on the internet, mostly. This is in spite of the empirically shown fact that actually, Children who are pornography production victims almost always know their perpetrators as either family members or acquaintances. So my, my point is nonetheless, the, in legislation and policy, that crime is imagined as an internet mediated one with strangers who conduct grooming behaviours. And of course, that, that category of the crime also exists, we know that. However, in, in, in empirical uh, scholarship, it's shown that actually that category of crime is most uh, commonly undertaken by family members and acquaintances, not through the internet. So those those victims of child pornography production procurement uh, are not sourced through the internet uh, in our empirical research most commonly. Okay, so highlighting the full range and nature of the myriad harms accruing to children and young people uh, from pornography is of course the jobs of academics, advocates and activists and conferences like that, uh, like this here today reflect that fact and thanks to the tireless efforts of people like you uh, coming today, uh, we have achieved substantial legislation innovation in Australia and most recently, as Michael mentioned, in relation to the uh, revenge pornography uh, distribution crimes. Uh, in my presentation today, I highlight yet another harm of pornography arising for children and young people that I see as not yet properly reflected in Australian legislation. And I should note that this harm arises for the fact of pornography itself rather than from the genre of child pornography specifically. However, it's a harm that afflicts children and young people in particular. So the point I'm making there uh, is that 
Uh, the particular harm that I'm going to describe today in the presentation arises irrespective of the particular genre of pornography that's used in the perpetration of the crime, whether it's pornography produced using children or pornography produced using adults. Um, so by way of introducing the, le the legislative gap I see in the current Australian legislation, I would first like to introduce a piece of research from 2005 that reported on findings of a large-scale survey of sex crimes perpetrated against children in the United States in a one-year period between the years 2000 and 2001. I know it's old, it's just the, like, the, the only piece of research we have in, in relation to this aspect. The study focuses on a subset of internet-mediated me, internet sex crimes against children, but within the subset describes a number of sex crimes perpetrated against children that involve pornography. And the ones that I wanted to highlight here today for the sake of the discussion uh, are those not relating to production, consumption or procurement activities. So I'm trying to introduce you to a fourth category of harm arising from pornography here. So in this study, uh, in addition to those other forms of harm, they highlighted uh, harms including seducing or grooming victim, victims through sending sexual pictures to victims, fondling or holding victims while jointly viewing child or adult pornography, and using online pornography to show victims how to perform sex acts. So I might have... Sorry about that, that's the quote there. And the researchers <clears throat> also mention pornography being used as a reward or an enticement to victims as part of perpetrator, offend perpetrator offending against the victims. So I think this description shows pornography being used in a range of instrumental ways. So uh, the fourth category I introduced to you is pornography is an instrumental harm. So I jumped ahead there. Um, to facilitate the sexual abuse of children. These descriptions are important, I think, for their identifi identification of harms that arise from pornography that are not consumption, production or procurement based. In this particular case that I raise, the harms arise as a result of, uh, instead, the instru instrumental use of pornography as a tool of abuse or intimidation of children. Uh, and as, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, it's important to note that this category of harm arises in relation to pornography, I believe, irrespective of the genre, whether it's child pornography material or not. Um, there is legislation in Australia that criminalises some instrumental uses of pornography, so the fourth category of harm that I raise. For example, the Queensland Criminal Code on the screen now uh, criminalises people who, quote, without legitimate reason, willfully expose a child to indecent material. And just noting this provision in the Queensland Criminal Code, uh, that it is the willful rather than the, rather than the neglectful or the incidental exposure of children to pornography that is criminalised. So incidental, accidental exposure, exposure of children to pornography in household context at least <coughs> are not yet criminalised <coughs> in that code or any other that I was able to find. Uh, the New South Wales Crimes Act uh, under its grooming provisions, and this is where mostly you'll find in the various state and federal legislation uh, where you'll find instrumental uh, provisions that address instrumental uses of pornography in perpetration of sex crime, you'll find them under the grooming provisions in many cases. And the New South Wales Code uh, criminalises an adult person who engages in conduct that exposes a child to indecent material, but only if this exposure is part of a scheme to facilitate their sexual abuse. So sexual abuse has to be an intended activity <coughs> uh, outcome of the exposure in the first place. Uh, so in other words, it doesn't, um, it doesn't criminalise the exposure to children uh, in of itself. So these instrumental uses of pornography are certainly a feature of child sex offending in Australia and should be criminalised. I have no problem with the legislation as we have it. However, I believe there is one more category of harm accruing to children and young people from pornography that is unfortunately neglected in the drafting of these provisions against instrumental uses of pornography. So I'm, I'm focusing on the instrumental uses in the legislation. Um, so Western governments all over, in the, all over the world, including in the United States, recognise they have a duty to shield children from pornographic media content, even that content broadcast on the internet in some countries, not so much Australia, on the basis this exposure is harmful and even abusive of children. Uh, this obligation to protect is recognised above and beyond concerns about pornography being used to groom children. So grooming is a very core central concept within considerations about child exposure to pornography, 
However, we, we don't even need to go that far to see that in various Western legislatures and case law that these states are concerned, even in America, are concerned about exposure for exposure's sake. Not just as not just as part of a scheme to abuse a, a child in the end, in the end of it, um, evidence that governments believe they have some duty of care towards children to prevent exposure includes the fact that we have legal restrictions on on entry to cinemas for films classified for certain ages, and criminal penalties for sellers of eighteen plus classified products. And I do take note of the weakness of these provisions, but I'm not so much concerned with the detail. More that we can actually identify this concept in in the mind of government and in the mind of law that that, that exposure should be criminalised as a harm. It's more than the harm that I'm looking to acknowledge within uh, the government's thinking. So while the existence of these criminal provisions indicate governments are prepared to act to stop adults exposing children to pornography in the commercial or public sphere, governments, I believe, don't appear to act upon any similar sense of responsibility in relation to the private or household sphere. The reality, as I know everyone here knows, is that we now live in a society where many children are residing in households with fathers and sometimes male siblings who are consuming pornography and sometimes in large volume. And I'm just picking on the main uh, uh, paradigm of how this kind of uh, activity takes place. However, for the, uh, the abusive nature of pornography exposure that government recognises for children in the public sphere, I believe, does not seem to transfer to the private sphere. And I think this fact is indicated in the Queensland and New South Wales legislation on the screen uh, in which exposure needs to be willful or part of a scheme of sex crime to attract legal sanction. This compares with cinema proprietors, for example, in the public sphere who are criminally liable for exposure regardless of whether they expose the child accidentally, without willful intent, without any desire, for, you know, uh, eventual outcome of sexual <coughs> abuse that that exposure alone is criminalised. So while men for many decades have consumed pornography in the home, the emergence of the internet, as we know, now creates household environments that are, high, that are highly vulnerable to individual pornography use that is intrusive, reckless and abusive of household members. And judgments appearing in Australian courts are beginning to show evidence of mothers facing significant problems in households in buffering their children from pornography exposure arising from the reckless consumption habits of family members in households. So I'll now just describe one case from the Australian Federal Court. These cases are very common to see in the judgments uh, that are posted from Australian courts now. So the, case, the, the example that I'll give you here is from December 2015. I only had to look back that far to find an example. Uh, this case uh, appears to involve significant exposure of a child to pornography as a result of his father's internet use. So in the particular case I show, the exposure does not appear to have been any part of a scheme to abuse the child. There's no evidence of that in the case. Um, although I should note that the, the, the exposure did appear to occur as part of a fairly intense scheme of abuse of the boy's mother. Um, but this was a family law, ca family law case, not a criminal case, so that was not an issue actually in the, in the court's comments. It was an access... Um, custody access to the child issue. So I won't focus on those, the, the abusive aspects, but here I'll just cite verbatim parts of the judgment that relate to the husband's recklessness in exposing his son to pornography. So the judge in his reasoning wrote in December 2015, quote, the father's obsession with pornographic material escalated after the son was born. And he calls the son X in this paragraph, so from now on X is the son. He watched pornography and masturbated in the study on almost a daily basis at all hours of the day and night, including immediately after they had sex together, that's with the mother, um, unconcerned about X's whereabouts. When in the study, the father would remove his clothes and sit at the computer naked. The mother several times walked into the study to see the father naked behind the desk watching pornography and masturbating, whether, X, whether or not X was awake or nearby. She recalls saying to the father on occasions, quote, please turn the DVD or the computer off or the volume down as X can hear it. On occasions, X said to her, the mother, um, where is daddy, what is he doing? And the mother would respond, daddy is just doing some work. At times, the father demanded she go into the study where he was watching pornography and forced her into certain uh, positions to pleasure him sexually. The study door had no lock, 
So if the father was in there alone, the mother would keep X away, or if possible, take him away from the house. The mother deposes to three occasions where she failed to stop him going in. She says X walked into the study to find his father naked and masturbating. On one occasion, after X, X had actually gone into the room, the boy X came out and said to her, Mummy, Daddy is looking at ladies with no clothes on. So that's just, just the evidence of... The, the, the judgment uh, transcript is very long, so I've just excerpted the, evidence, the direct evidence in relation to exposure. So in this case, uh, the outcome of the, the family law court hearing was that the father was awarded weekend access rights to his son. Uh, this is despite a consulting psychologist testifying in court that he had shown no comprehension or remorse for his behaviour, not against his wife or against the son. And the judge agreed with the psychologist on the basis of statements the father actually made in court, and then he quotes those statements, the father had no contrition or, or um, acknowledgement at all. Um, I'm only saying that not to particularly take issue with the judgment in this particular case, but purely to say or to point out what I think is the fact that the Australian judiciary does not seem to notice uh, ex uh, exposure of children to pornography in of itself as being a harm that might affect their ultimate judgment or comments. It wasn't taken, uh, it was acknowledged as having occurred in detail and described in detail, but that fact then wasn't taken by the judiciary to, to um, affect the, the outcome. In other words, custody was, was granted. Um, access, sorry, access, big pardon, big pardon. Uh, yes, so, and so I'm, I'm citing this example to add to the evidence on the screen um, of the uh, criminal law as also in Australia, not fully recognising uh, ch exposure of pornography to, to children as in of itself as being a harm requiring action, uh, criminal action. There are, though, in fairness, only a handful of researchers who have empirically investigated the effects of pornography exposure on children in families. Jennifer Schneider, in the year 2000, published results of research uh, with children in 70 families, so quite large, and identified 10 ways in which their lives were negatively affected by the pornography consumption of family members. Of the 10 problems she identifies, two indicated situations that are potentially, I can, as, as far as I see, abusive of children. The first one was encountering pornographic material a parent has acquired, and the second one, encountering a parent masturbating. Uh, it's my belief that at the moment at least, Australian institutions do not appear to recognise the abusive nature of these forms of exposure inflicted on children in households, unless they are part of green, uh, schemes of grooming for sexual abuse, um, for, uh, for sexual abuse. Sorry, I'm jumping ahead there. Um, but just to, to sum up my comments on this issue, um, I think that as uh, pornography consumption in homes becomes more normalised in Australian society, or it has become already normalised to a high, to a great extent uh, because of internet channelling and lack of ISP filtering in Australia. And as the volume of pornography being consumed in household increases, as men and boys become acculturated to its habitual use from an early age, I think instances of children being recklessly exposed to pornography and its, and its consumption will increase even if this exposure is not a part of a scheme to sexually abuse a child, not a grooming-related crime, in other words. Um, I believe we might seek to slow down these kind of developments uh, in this direction by strengthening legislative provisions against exposure to indecent, indecent materials, that's the phrase that tends to be used, uh, to eliminate any reference to willful. So we could lobby, or, um, to, um, yeah, lobby, uh, such, lobby toward changes that um, remove this idea that exposure in of itself is not the harm. In other words, that exposure, as we've seen for domestic violence recently in Australian society, where the um, child Australian uh, Federal Child Rights Commissioner has um, written reports about the harm of domestic violence to children as including exposure in of itself, regardless of whether those children are inflicted with the violence themselves. Exposure alone is recognised as a harm. I think in relation to Australian legislation and policy, we could also forge ahead with that kind of understanding of exposure in of itself as being a harm, regardless of willful. Um, and this would concurrently require research in the public education about the abusive nature of child exposure 
to pornography even when accidental. Um, I believe these efforts would not ultimately be for the purpose of encouraging fathers to be more discreet in their pornography consumption, even if this was an outcome. Um, it's more that I envisage this kind of initiative as part of wider efforts to encourage the questioning of the legitimacy of unfettered pornography consumption in households. Um, we know, everyone here already knows, that Western governments have chosen to not legislate or interfere in the pornography, mostly the pornography consumption uh, via the internet in homes. ISP filtering has been off the table in Australia now. Um, but I think we might think about ways, uh, even small ways like this one, to start to break down that ideology that pornography consumption in homes is a right um, in relation to which the state should not interfere. And I think this is an, an example of how we could do that. Um, obviously, the idea that private consumption of pornography in homes uh, should be protected from the state intervention is just an ideological one. And obviously, we've overcome this kind of ideological uh, conception of privacy in relation to domestic violence against women in homes, marital rape, etc. So it can be broken down. Um, and uh, to conclude, I think we should use similar tactics to dismantle the ideological privacy that currently protects pornography users in households. Um, of which use is currently inflicting um, harms, I believe, against children through exposure, but also from the, the um, court judgment that I read out to you, it, um, hurting their mothers as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.